또 더메넥 이렇게 인사를 좀 박수 큰 박수 부탁드립니다. 예, 박수 좀 부탁드립니다. 아, uh, so uh, thank you for putting this on. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, if you were at Beyond Blocks yesterday, you may have um, seen this already, but um, let's go through it again, and maybe we can answer the questions uh, afterwards. Um, so uh, Divinity is creating something called the Internet Computer, and uh, has a general mission to host the world's next generation of software systems and services. So it supports a different software model, um, and that's why we say the next generation of software systems. So the basic idea is, um, you know, you can describe a computer mathematically, and of course, um, people like von Neumann and Alan Turing did this um, last century. And, uh, you know, when you describe a computer mathematically, it's, you know, just talking about how you process instructions and data, it's actually rather simple. It wasn't long before people started making um, physical computers. Uh, the most famous one was at Bletchley Park in in, uh, in the United Kingdom during the Second World War. It was used to uh, decipher um, encrypted German communications. Um, but of course, uh, computers became more and more intrinsic to our economy. Um, this picture is a classic sort of server blade, but you know, a smartphone is a, is a computer, a laptop is a computer. There are lots of physical computers. Um, what's interesting is you can also create uh, a, com a computer from a network of computers, because really a, a computer is described mathematically. It's just something that processes instructions and data. So, you know, Definity is concerned with uh, a computer you can create from a network of computers. So the basic idea is that, you know, you can connect more and more computers together and create a public supercomputer. So you can install, you know, more software, run more computations, store more data. And that this thing will just grow, the network will grow in size to deliver whatever kind of capacity the world needs. So, uh, you know, um, it's, it's a decentralized network, and it, that means it'll be supported by miners. Um, th these miners are very different to Bitcoin miners. They're not, not, not doing proof of work. They're running um, machines that look like server, you know, classic server blades, which meet a reference specification that is provided by the Definity Foundation. And there'll be different kinds of reference specification for different hardware. And t typically, it'll be installed in um, private hosting centers. So, you know, c currently, um, you know, cloud, cloud 1.0 was private hosting centers, right? Companies used to, you know, rent rack space and get a cage in a private hosting center. And then cloud 2.0 came along, which was Amazon Web Services and uh, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, and they bundled more services with the cloud hosting and became very successful. And today, you know, the cloud 1.0 providers, the private hosting providers, have a lot of empty rack space. There's, you know, even the really big, nominally successful ones have a lot of empty rack space. So, <clears throat> you know, we encourage uh, these private hosting centers, or we'll be encouraging them to install Definity nodes in their empty rack space and, um, you know, become the backers of cloud 3.0. So the internet computer will be created by large scale mining across thousands of hosting locations internationally eventually. And, you know, we believe it's, if it's successful, eventually um, the Definity network will comprise many millions of nodes um, to, Give you some idea. Uh, the current cloud point 2.0, which is Amazon, Google, and so on, uh, consists of five to ten million servers. But the Definity um, uh, network involves more hardware because there's more replication and cryptography is very CPU intensive and so on. So, you know, if cloud 2.0 is five to ten million servers, then probably 
Cloud 3.0 would be 50 to 100 million servers. But it introduces other kinds of efficiency. And that's why um, I believe it can be successful. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's obviously a token operated network. And all um, stateful decentralized networks have to be token operated. Um, the tokens mediate participation in, in the network. <clears throat> so if, if the network is um, truly open, you know, if, if you have a public supercomputer, well, the risk is that some hacker just installs some dumb software that just creates loads of junk data or consumes all the computing capacity. So the way you solve that is by, you know, embedding tokens in the in the protocol so you have to pay for to install software to run computations to store data and so every activity is mediated by tokens including the governance of the network um, and and mining you know, if you want to connect one of these um, nodes to the network you'll need some number of definitives to um, create an identity for that for that node so uh, you know it truly is a token operated network it, you need tokens to participate in every activity that the network supports. Um, it's worth saying, uh, you know, Definity is a true decentralized network. So, uh, you know, for example, our test net uh, that we run continuously is about 400 nodes distributed around the world. Um, and we would run a bigger test net, but actually it's pretty expensive running a test net of 400 computers anyway. Um, but every single um, computer in that network has an equal role. There's no, there aren't any special block producers or coordinators or validators or anything like that. Every node has exactly the same role as every other node. And people forget that if you, uh, you know, the, there's a reason for decentralization. You're meant to create a more robust, reliable system that's more resilient to attack. And, you know, certainly if, for example, you know, you introduce a network with 21 block producers, well, they're, they're vulnerable to DDoS, right? I mean, it's, I mean and, and is, is it really plausible that the whole world will build on top of a network that depends on 21 special computers? Seems very unlikely to me. Or even in the case of IOTA, one special computer, the, the, the coordinator node. So anyway, so we, we care very much about this. You know, we believe that Definity is far more decentralized than any other network in existence. Um, I mean, it's certainly true that, you know, a network like Bitcoin or Ethereum is an open network. Anybody can connect a proof of work miner to the Ethereum network. So it is open, unlike, for example, EOS, you have to be friends with the founders. It's like a, more like a consortium, not really a, it's not really a decentralized system at all. EOS is really a consortium system, you know, and if you're in the club, then you might have got one of the special tickets that allow you to run one of these block producers. That's not a decentralized network. It's complete nonsense, right? But it's not open, right? It's not an open network. I mean, I can't be a block producer on EOS, right? So it's not an open network. Obviously, um, now obviously, Bitcoin and Ethereum are open networks uh, because anybody can, who has mining equipment, can mine on those networks, and you know, they're arguably decentralized. But um, you know, because of the nature of proof of work and uh, people consolidate uh, hashing capability within these mining pools, um, in practice, you know. Um, there are a very small number of individual miners on the Bitcoin and Ethereum networks. It's controlled by, you know, I don't know five to ten parties or something, really, in, in both cases. So Definity, you know, wants to, uh, or, you know, has created um, a, a system that allows, you know, millions of nodes to connect in a network, um, but without having any special nodes. All the nodes are the same. And that's what I mean when I say it's a true decentralized network. So um, you know, the, the next question is, you know, what, what does this thing run? 
and uh, Divinity um, uh, runs WebAssembly software. So uh, I don't know if you heard about WebAssembly. It's it's a sort of standard for universal software, and it was actually co-created by a Divinity staff engineer called Andreas Rosberg, who currently sort of leads the standards process and um, spends a lot of time working on WebAssembly, obviously, but also works on uh, new languages that the uh, Definity network will support. So um, the great thing about WebAssembly is it's already supported by all of the main web browsers. So it's, it's, a, it's like a virtual machine specification, and you can compile down many different languages to create a web piece of WebAssembly software, but it runs at native speed. So, you know, the next generation of uh, user experiences and client applications will be written in WebAssembly. And um, I don't think it'll be too long before, you know, WebAssembly virtual machines turn up on um, smartphones and we can create smartphone applications, um, you know, from WebAssembly. So anyways, you know, for the most part, you know, um, in the future, we believe um, user experiences and front-end applications will be created in WebAssembly that runs on uh, in web browsers. So that's the front-end support. And we want Definity to be the back-end support so that you have you know, WebAssembly from the front all the way to the back, end-to-end WebAssembly. Um, I won't go into this uh, in too much detail, maybe in Q&A if people are interested, but it's not just WebAssembly. We're trying to create um, a framework for people to um, develop WebAssembly in. And um, this framework aims to meet a number of needs. It's true that it, it enables us to create software units that are distributable throughout the Definity network. And, um, but it introduces a completely new model for software engineering. And it, its purpose is to greatly simplify, um, as well, well, firstly, increase the portability of software systems, but also greatly simplify development. And a canister is just the combination of the software and the data it stores. Um, but uh, we introduce something called orthogonal persistence. So, you know, in the Definity model, there are no APIs. There's no, like, database API or storage API or file API or anything like that. It's a, it's a completely new system. Um, and each web canister effectively runs ACT as, ACT as software. So it communicates asynchronously with other uh, web canisters by passing messages. And of course, a message is really just a function call. But, you know, we, we want to produce an end-to-end -end solution. So... You know, once a developer learns WebAssembly inside the browser, possibly using tooling and languages that we provide, then they don't really need to learn new skills to create the back end on Definity. It'll be the same language, right? You can use the same language inside the browser as you can on the internet computer. And the additional skills that you need are going to be very minimal. So, ironically, a lot of people think about blockchain specialism and Needing, people needing to know all these special skills. The purpose of the Definity Network is to remove all complexity from IT. So we want uh, software developers just to, you know, write business logic, essentially, and f forget about anything else. So, you know, the uh, network um, and the development framework, software model, provides a lot of great features. So... Um, one of the key features is that, uh, you know, we, we create a, provide a super low cost R&D model. So our aim is to greatly simplify the development of systems. Uh, because if you look at the, if you look at the total cost of ownership of a software system, of IT infrastructure, actually hardware is only a very small component of the cost. The great majority of the cost is actually, um, you know, human capital cost of developing the software, the cost of maintaining the software, the cost of administrating the software. The vast majority of the cost is human capital. Hardware is a very small piece. So, um, you know, a decentralized system <clears throat> will always involve more computation than 
you know, a system made up of individual components like a, you know, an EC2 instance on Amazon Web Services. You know, running software on an EC2 instance will always involve less hardware, right? Because it's not doing encryption for a start. In addition to that, uh, Definity um, symmetrically replicates data so that it never gets lost, right? It's always available. Um, so Definity is using more hardware than Amazon, some traditional software system with a database and EC2 instance and whatever else is being used. Well, the hardware costs more money, right? More, more hardware is being used. But we want to reduce the cost of um, software systems. And the important point here is that the vast majority of the cost is um, actually tied up in the human capital. So we want to greatly simplify, we want to use, you know, our advanced techniques, you know, cryptography and distributed computing and all these other things to create a much simpler platform that makes it much simpler for people to develop um, systems. So, you know, in a way we're offering a kind of bargain where the traditional, the traditional technology stack is, you know, Microsoft SQL Server, ASP.NET, firewalls, middleware servers, application servers, um, EC2 instances, all this stuff. The whole traditional technology industry is based around selling complexity. So we offer a kind of swap. So, you know, it's a bit like the traditional technology industry sells you complexity. This public network will provide you with simplicity. So if you build on Definity, your hardware costs will increase. The amount of money you're paying per computing cycle, the amount of money you're paying per megabyte of data stored um, will increase quite significantly. But your overall costs will drop dramatically because a vastly simpler model has been provided. And that's you know one of the key plays of the Definity network. But of course, there are other advantages too. <clears throat> the platform itself is, is essentially hack proof, right? You know, the Definity virtual computer isn't like a physical computer. You can't acquire a, a, a terminal window and try and you know do some fancy trick and escalate your permissions and change the password file or whatever it is and get root access or whatever it is you, you would normally do to hack into a traditional server. It's just not possible because you know the Definity computer is entirely virtual. It's created by the protocol. So the platform's essentially hack proof. Um, obviously, you can make some mistakes in your software development and create an insecure system, but the platform's hack-proof. It's also designed with something called a capability-based security model, so it's vastly more secure than a, one of the early sort of like a smart contract platform like Ethereum, for example. Yeah, there's no re-entrancy bugs. You can't just access any contract that's been uploaded and so on. The systems on the platform can interoperate very easily. Um, we have privacy technologies uh, based around enclaves and things like that so people can try and preserve the privacy of the data. It's not so secure, but certainly if you were going to create like an internet dating app and you wanted, wanted to protect the embarrassing chats you could put in, use this and for all intents and purposes make it secure. Um, and there's a bunch of things. Then we're trying to give people a future-proof uh, framework for developing software. And this is why we're creating new standards around WebAssembly. Um, there's some things uh, like Eternal execution, you know, this idea that I, I won't try to describe it now, but orthogonal persistence, you know, the software just runs forever and uh, you don't need a database or files to persist your data. So we're removing every API, every complexity. It's a new model for developing software. Finally, we also support autonomous software. So autonomous software is very interesting because you can create software systems that aren't owned by any person or organization. And you can put a governance system into the autonomous software so that the autonomous software can update itself. And the idea is that uh, we're going to sort of re-engineer internet services to be open source businesses. So looking at the different um, sectors, there are sort of four, four main sectors of application um, of Definity. Uh, for, first of all, there's private IT systems. So that might be an, an e-commerce service run by a company. It might be something that tracks product and inventory. It might be something that tracks human resources. 
just a private software system. Whereas today, someone might build that private software system and upload it to Amazon EC2 or run it from their own servers in a private hosting center or put it on Google Cloud. We want, we actually, one of our main aims is to provide the world with a different way of creating and hosting software services. So we want people to create private software, you know, private IT systems that run on Definity rather than Amazon and Google Cloud and so on. Secondly, um, industry platforms. So has anyone ever heard of the Tracer, Tracer chain run by De Beers? Okay, so De Beers is the biggest company in the diamond industry and they're working on a shared supply chain system for the entire industry. So I was part of the team that um, made that original pitch and I was um, involved in, been involved on and off in, in the project. And, um, so the idea there is that you create a supply chain that everybody in the industry connects up to. So that means, you know, miners, diamond miners in Botswana, um, wholesalers who buy the diamonds from the miners, um, people who cut and polish the diamonds in India, um, you know, jewelry manufacturers in, in Paris, Tiffany's in London that sells the jewelry, right? So you track, track the diamonds all the way through. So I forget what it is, but it's, a, it's an enormous, you know, um, enormously valuable supply chain. It's something like 60 billion a year or something. I forget, was it 30 billion? A lot, you know, huge tens of billions of dollars flow across this supply chain. And there are also, you know, there, there are some benefits in the diamond industry and in tracking diamonds. You can add provenance to the diamonds, which makes them more interesting and possibly more valuable. You can um, make it harder for people to put blood diamonds into the, into the, into, into, the, into circulation. But if you analyze the, the supply chain, it turns out that billions of dollars are tied up in unpaid invoices at any one time because, you know, most invoices have 90 day payment terms. So you can also do things like, you know, create a, a trade financing, or invoice discounting um, market where people can finance invoices. So if someone's got an invoice, you know, that's not going to be paid for 90 days, a financier can come in and say, look, I'm going to pay you 97% of the value of the invoice today. And then in three months time, he collects 100%. He's made 3% profit in three months so uh, but there's lots and lots it's almost un potentially a lot of industries um, could benefit from sharing uh, these kind of platforms so you know you could call them consortium platforms but I, I, I would tend I think that the future is that they'll be more open and you know they'll be managed by associations in Switzerland with, uh, with a bit of control by voting tokens and so on um, so anyway we're interested in that and we'd, we'd work with um, quite a few corporate partners um, who are interested in this stuff. Third thing is internet services, and this is really exciting. So we believe the whole nature of the internet is gonna change. And, you know, the internet was originally devised so that communication could continue in the event of a nuclear war. And to make that possible, the internet had to be based on something called packet switching. and to be fundamentally decentralized in nature. Packet switching meant that um, data could be routed um, through any available route that would be dynamically selected, you know. And clearly, if you want to make a network that's resistant to um, some terrible event like a nuclear war, um, you, you can't have central points of failure. So you can't have special, or you have to minimize special computers. Of course, there are BGP routers, but there are lots and lots of them. Um, and you certainly can't have an organization that's responsible for controlling the network because you could just, you know, the organization could be bombed and that would be the end of the network. So, um, you know, uh, the internet was an open protocol and actually this was responsible for its growth too. Because the internet was an open protocol, anybody could first of all extend it. And I remember when the internet took off in the 1990s in the, in the United Kingdom, you know, there were, I think hundreds of ISPs in those days before consolidation, hundreds of ISPs sprung up and provided internet services to people over modems. So that was one reason it succeeded. Ind independent parties could extend the internet and make it bigger. Um, but another 
bigger reason was that it was a permissionless environment. So, you know, by contrast, for example, there were networks like America Online, CompuServe, in the United Kingdom, there was this thing called uh, the Information Superhighway that British Telecom tried to persuade the British government to adopt. They said, you know, the internet's very dangerous, it's unregulated, and, you know, people might see bad content, and all this, you, know, you can imagine the arguments, and thankfully, the British government didn't buy it, and there was no information superhighway, but, you know, back in the day, if you wanted to provide a service uh, on America Online, you had to ask the permission of America, of America Online, right? And... Um, Obviously, even if you got permission from America Online to provide a service on the America Online network, if America Online changed its mind, they could just turn your service off. So as it turns out, um, not only could independent parties grow the internet, um, which meant it could expand quickly, but also everybody preferred to use the internet because it was permissionless and open. So, you know, if you created a website and you connected your service to the internet, Nobody could turn you off. And you didn't have to worry about your competitor or some bigger company saying, sorry, we don't like you anymore. Um, and this meant that it created an explosion, uh, which you know, created the dot-com boom, because all of these startups connected to the internet and sort of built, built the future. However, um, one part of the internet vision is, was missing, and, and that was that uh, the hosting of internet services was highly centralized, first of all. So today, um, internet services uh, are mainly hosted in a handful of private hosting centers run by Amazon, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, and so on. And so first of all, you know, these are large monopolistic companies. So if you, you know, build your web service and host it in, inside Amazon, Amazon could decide to turn you off or change your pricing or something like that. But also, actually, it's very, it's, it, it, it's vulnerable to attack. I mean, you know, uh, a clever terrorist could simply fly airplanes into this relatively small number of hosting centers, and the internet would just go dark. That'd be it. You know, like 90% of all our services are, at, are in a handful of mega, de, mega hosting centers around the world. So that's not very good. But in addition to that, not only is the hosting very centralized, but the internet services themselves are very centralized, right? So, you know, social networks, Facebook, Search, Google, um, you know, CRM, Salesforce, uh, business networking, LinkedIn, right? It's hugely monopolistic. And this means that it's not an open system. Our ecosystem is not open. So, for example, I'll give you a simple example. Um, there was a games company called Zinger. Who remembers Zinger? They created this thing called Farmville. Remember Farmville? It was like a social game on Facebook, right? Okay, so this was like, going back some years, like 10 years maybe or something, but um, this games company in San Francisco created a game called Farmville that grew explosively on Facebook. And I think it had like so many, like tens of millions of users or something, or hundreds of millions of users, of users even. And Zinger... Um, did an IPO and they were worth like $5 billion or something like that. But then Facebook decided to change the rules. Facebook decided to change the rules that Zinger was using to promote itself. And all of a sudden, Zinger's growth collapsed because Facebook decided they wanted to promote their own stuff a bit and constrain how Zinger was able to use friend relationships to promote his games. And obviously, Zinger has never really recovered, okay? I, I can tell you lots of stories like that. I knew a company in Palo Alto called Relate IQ that created a kind of map of communications inside your company and outside your company. Really cool. And you could look at this map and you could hover. You could see who was talking to who, and both internally and externally, and you could see that you know, someone outside the company was waiting for some news from this person inside the company. And you could hover your mouse over the vertices in the network and, and a profile would pop up but that profile was coming from LinkedIn right and then uh, this company Relate IQ was a unicorn it was worth more than a billion dollars and then unfortunately LinkedIn decided that the only people that could access the profile data 
were Microsoft and Salesforce just overnight. So, you know, Relate IQ found out they had a month to find an alternative, but their whole product was built upon the premise that they could show this profile letter. So what happened? They had to sell themselves to Salesforce, right? I think it was for 240 million. But this is just, you know, there are hundreds and hundreds of examples. It's called platform risk. You know, if you're an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley and you want to raise m money from venture capitalists, the first thing they'll look at is platform risk. Like, are you depending on the goodwill of some other company? Right? Do you depend upon other services generally provided by a monopoly that could just change its mind at a whim and, and, and stop you? So... Um, does that make sense? It's a problem. So anyway, we think that you can use autonomous software to create, recreate all of the internet services as open source businesses. So the software service um, has an inbuilt governance system. It's tokenized, has a governance system, and it can update its own software. And, you know, it'll put out bounties for, for feature implementations and people will suggest code and so on. Um, ultimately, you know, we've had open source software, but we can, have, we can also have open source businesses, right? And these can provide all kinds of guarantees to users and also to um, other systems that are using their data. So, and imagine now that you had an open source business built from autonomous software like an open source LinkedIn or an open source Salesforce. And the open source LinkedIn provided you with guarantees about how you could access the profile data. Well, that would make it a much more exciting uh, platform to build against, right? It'd be much more exciting to build on an open source LinkedIn than it would be to, to build on a monopolistic LinkedIn. And so we think there'll be a kind of mutualized network effects are coming into play once this thing takes off where everybody wants to build on the open internet, on the internet computer, right? Rather than some big, you know, so in the end you won't build on top of some big monopoly like Google or Amazon. And in addition to that, you'll interface with open source platforms that give you guarantees about your data. These systems will also give users guarantees about their data. So, you know, um, the dating app is a classic one at the moment, right? There's a, you know, a lot of people don't realize this, that most of these databases will be hacked. People say embarrassing things on these dating apps. But these databases are all going to be hacked and be on the internet for everyone's entertainment at some point. Nobody should doubt it, right? If those companies make one mistake, one misconfiguration of their network, they have a disgruntled employee, the um, data is going to be out there, right? For everyone's entertainment. And people... You know, people sometimes are on these things for years and have lots of embarrassing chats and they never consider for a second that these databases held by these centralized companies will eventually, with very high likelihood, be available on the internet to the public um, once they get hacked. So you can imagine alternatively that you would create an open, an open source, a dating app as an open source business and this would put the chat uh, into like an enclave, like a crypto lockbox that provides guarantees about how who can access that data. And it might be that inside the crypto lockbox, you can run matching algorithms that look for keywords to find, you know, to better match people. But all it spits out is like try matching these two people. Nobody can ever see what's, although the algorithms run inside the crypto lockbox on the data, the chat data, nobody can get that chat data from inside. So you can see that there are a lot of advantages, right? You know, you can, the hardware is not the hardware. You know the, the hosting s system itself isn't vulnerable because it's distributed across thousands of. You know your data is distributed across many. You know potentially thousands of not thousands of locations because you wouldn't use that level of replication. But you, you know your data is more widely distributed. You're not depending on a small number of mega hosting centers. You're not depending on the monopolies that run those hosting centers, and you're not depending upon if you're you know creating something like this related IQ. You're not depending upon uh, some monopolistic platform like LinkedIn to supply you the profile data. And you can also give guarantees to users, right? Like your data will not become public, will not be shared. These are the guarantees that's enshrined in code. And 
Well, we think that's a very, very powerful proposition. And you know, if you, we don't know how long it's going to take, but if you scroll forward, we're not going to have a monopolistic internet. You know, open source internet services are the future. Um, not least because of the sort of mutualized network effects that um, people will gain. You know, no, once this takes root, no, no entre young entrepreneur or innovator in their right mind would build a centralized system that interfaces with these monopolies. They're going to want to build on the uh, open internet. Finally, of course, uh, finance. Um, there's a project called FI, um, which we're very keen to get built on Affinity. It's like an open banking system, like a decentralized commercial banking. We use random numbers to drive a system that actually is able to give out loans. Um, obviously, ICOs and fundraising, people will do that whether you want them to or not. <laughs> Charities and so on. So, how is the um, network governed? Um, so, this is another difference with Affinity. Um, we believe governance is necessary, but you know we're committed to decentralization. So, you know, some people have tried to solve um, governance by having these kind of constitutions and human arbitrators and all this kind of stuff. Um, to us, to be honest, that's a complete nonsense, right? You know, these networks should exist independently of some board, and that's not a decentralized network, is it? Because you're now depending upon this sort of group of people to arbitrate disputes and, and things like that, right? Um, so, yeah, we have this thing called the blockchain nervous system, which uh, is actually simpler than you might imagine. Essentially, it just processes proposals, and each proposal uh, in the first version is either adopted or rejected. And adopted proposals are run using privileged software on the computer, which I suppose in that sense acts a bit like an operating system, right? And, uh, you know, there's a bunch of, proposals can do a bunch of different things. You can upgrade the protocol, you can manage network structure, uh, modify network economics, patch broken user systems, uh, fix or freeze miscreant systems, like if there's an ISIS slave market or something horrible on the computer that needs to be turned off. The blockchain nervous system can do it. Potentially it can fix hacks. If, um, Although there's a delay, someone's using an airlock system, um, and it's it's it essentially just a voting system, right? Um, you people can create neurons by depositing definitives, and the uh, once you've deposited definitives in a new you know, to, to create a neuron, you can only get those definitives back by dissolving the neuron, but um, dissolving the neuron takes some time. So your neuron will get paid for voting. Um, and the longer your definitives are locked up in the neuron, the more the voting power, of, the greater of the voting power, um, and the greater the rewards. Um, ob obviously, the um, voting power is proportional to the number of definitives locked up, right? And the rewards are proportional to the. If, if you if you make all votes, you know the rewards are proportional to the um, number of definitives locked up. Um, the reason they call neurons is most people like you know you can the proposals have different topics so you have like a proposal like cryptography, like no one very few people actually have the expertise to um, vote on proposals concerning cryptography. So people configure their neurons to follow other neurons. So for example, you know when you set up your you know the, the neurons are managed by client software. When you set up your client, uh, you might configure it to follow the neurons belonging to you know, five people in the cryptography community who, you know, are interested in Definity uh, and have, have shared their neuron addresses. And say, look, follow these five other neurons. If three of those neurons vote adopt, vote adopt. If three, three of those neurons vote reject, vote reject. If neither of those things happen within a timeout, reject, right? So the thing cascades to decisions. And effectively, it just encapsulates trust, trust relationships. So this thing I think was proposed in 2016, a couple of years ago. There's some blog posts that describe this in reasonable detail from back then. So if you go onto the Definity Medium and scroll back a couple of years, um, you, you can find a lot of um, some articles on the blockchain nervous system. So finally, who is pursuing this um, technology? I mean, we've actually, whoops, I think I've jumped one. Oh. Ah. Yeah, I got a, I've got a different version. Never mind. But um, <laughs> there's a, anyways, there's um, uh, um, uh, yeah, 
Yeah, I've got an old version. That's funny. But anyway, there's a, there's a foundation. There's a not-for-profit foundation in, uh, based in Switzerland. And uh, its purpose is to you know, perform research, implementation of the research. Um, when the network launches, um, you know, threat mitigation and uh, operations. Um, but these are things that are done in a decentralized way. It's just performing a supporting role. The network doesn't depend on the foundation. Foundation's well-funded. Um, we've got some really good people. And actually, there's some. if you look at the team page, that's only a part of it. There's a whole, I can't announce it yet, but there's some really amazing new people as well joining. Um, and so we're trying to build out this, what we call a NASA for decentralization. And so our strategy is just to continually scale out the team with the very best people, um, as well as you know, pursue, you know, just pursuing a very product-driven and um, engineering-driven approach. Uh, this actually is um, from the Palo, the, the Palo Alto office maybe six weeks ago or something. That was like with a test network. It's already changed a lot, but um, I don't know if you, any of you read the paper, but there's a thing called Threshold Relay, which generates random numbers that drives the other protocols. And, the green dots in that network graph are the nodes is are the nodes in the current group that are generating a new random number, notarizing a current block, and then sort of relaying to the next group. Um, that's actually running a block time of 1.8 seconds. When I left the network a few days ago, sorry, I left uh, Palo Alto office a few days ago, um, it was actually running a 0.65 second block time, and that's over the public internet. So, um, you know, uh, it's a genuine blockchain, probabilistic blockchain protocol. It's not using BFT. It has all of the advantages of a probabilistic blockchain protocol. But um, we take advantage of various things. I mean, it, this blockchain is already very quick. It reaches finality very fast. Um, it's highly consistent, if you like, and, and that's as a result of the notarization of blocks performed by the same threshold groups that are generating the random numbers. Um, but we also have a thing called a finality detector, which is probabilistic. And in optimal operation, in optimal operation, um, you can get finality in, in two blocks. Uh, so, you know, think in production, that means two second finality is pra practical. Um, and obviously, if the, if the network is, experiences asynchrony, if it's under DOS attack or something, that um, Finality becomes slower, the consistency of the chain um, decreases. But yeah, none, nonetheless, I mean, it's extremely quick. And the reason we care about the speed is that it enables you to create systems with a you know reasonable user experience. So if you use, if you use Reddit, for example, if you use, anyone uses Reddit, you submit a new post on Reddit, often it'll take a few seconds, right? Because you're saving to the database and they've probably got some horrible legacy MySQL master slave, sharded master slave setup. But, you know, you create social media on Definity, the, the reads can be very, very fast indeed, actually. Um, but, you know, you want to submit a new post. Uh, I mean, if, if someone wants to care that it's actually, been, you know, there's no reorg, um, and you have to wait two seconds. Um, and it, it, you know, kind of, kind of makes it possible to um, create a financial exchange, for example. So, I actually, when... Um, Solidity was first released. I created a, a continuous double auction financial exchange, a sort of experimentation. And I found that, you know, the obviously the gas prices would be far too high and so it wouldn't work today, but um, it was different back then in 2015. And, you know, I could, I could, the, 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 the language was sufficient and the, the, the support you get for storing data was sufficient to create a sort of an exchange. Um, obviously not a high volume exchange, but an exchange nonetheless. The problem was that I realized that 10 minutes is just too slow. Like, you know, like Bitcoin takes an hour. There's a thing called a Poisson distribution. That's an hour in expectation. It can take longer. Um, it's 3,600 3, seconds. Um, Bitcoin's about 37 blocks, about 15 seconds a block. It's about 10 minutes with lower <coughs> variance because there's more blocks. Um, uh, that's 600 seconds. You know, if you, if you have to wait 10 minutes to check your trade isn't going to get reversed, right? And it actually happens. You know, so do your trade. Like your boss calls you. Can you sell those assets, please? And so now you press the sell button. You're going to watch the exchange for 10 minutes. Um, it just doesn't, doesn't work. It's no good. So, you know, a couple of finality of a couple of seconds really makes a lot more things uh, possible. 
And it actually turns out as well, if you want to create um, an, an, an unbounded network, so you want to scale it out, you have to do something called sharding. And unless you um, have rapid finality and are able to detect the finality, i.e. you've got some kind of finality detector, um, the communication between shards gets very, very slow indeed, right? Because unless you've got rapid finality and you can detect finality, you have to wait an awful, you know, if you're receiving a message from another shard, you have to wait an awful long time to make sure before you process that message in case the shard that sent you the message gets reorganized, right? It just doesn't work at all. So as it turns out, um, you need this kind of speed and finality detectors and so on um, to create a practical sharded network. Anyway, that's, that's it. <laughs> Yeah, so I have a, just two brief questions. Do you have any timeline for open source? Timeline for open sourcing your consensus algorithms or those kinds uh, of things? Yeah, so we have, a, we have some difficulty, right? So um, I don't actually need this, right? You can hear me. You can hear me, right? Um, we have some, so there are some challenges with that. And uh, I'll leave that for now. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, oops. Yeah, the, <laughs> the, yeah there, are some, there are some challenges. and. Um, it, it's certainly true that uh, today, pretty much anyone can invent some new theory for consensus or something like that, and you can run an ICO and you can collect an awful lot of money, right? Um, so much, in fact, that uh, it, it's kind of distorted the market. So um, I would certainly say that academics in the field of decentralization and blockchain aren't academics anymore. Well, not many of them. They're really entrepreneurs looking to run their own ICO. And um, oftentimes, they're aware of superior protocols and methodologies, but of course they never reference them because they want to run an ICO themselves. And how could they run an ICO if they knew about something that was better? Um, so academics aren't academics. Right? They just want to pump some often crazy idea, in my view, and, and, and run an ICO. And in addition to that, there are a lot of projects that um, you know, are very interested in Definity technology. And the, the difficulty for us is that if we make our systems available before we launch, they'll just appear in very, very quickly, immediately, in, in competitive systems. But Definity um, really doesn't believe in releasing proof of concept networks, right? So I, I'll say it quite now that there's not a single network uh, in production today that is anything more than a proof of concept. When you dig into the technology that's out there today, it's a shambles. I mean, it's just, you know, you look at, for example, the implementation of the P2P layer. Terrible, right? Um, not fit for purpose. Um, so, actually, Definity wants to <laughs> compete with the existing technology stack. So, you know, we, we've got a lot of engineering to do. I mean, right now, today, the Definity test network is far more sophisticated than any blockchain network in production. By, not by a small amount, but by a very, very large amount. Right? But we still don't think it's ready for production. Now, the, lots and lots of, we, we did, for example, push a lot of code live. We have some cryptography libraries for BLS. Really nice libraries. Um, you know, the, the, b before our new libraries, there was, some li there was a library out there in 2007. So we got like a 10x performance improvement on that. And invested a lot of money, um, making a really fast BLS library, put it on our GitHub. And, and of course, you don't get any kind of improvements, right, from it being open source. You can't crowdsource Cryptographers. In fact, there's only a very small pool of people that can write cryptography libraries. You have to understand side channel checks, this, that, write assembly, whatever. And but what did happen when we released these BLS libraries is lots and lots of other projects, um, you know, so well, thanks guys, you know, we're going to use them too and we're going to create random numbers. And so, you know, there are other components, for example, in Threshold Relay, like the DKG. And so we thought, hang on, do we want to release the DKG? Because this means that all of a sudden there's going to be all these like threshold relay, probabilistic slot consensus networks uh, long before the Definity network launches. 
And, and you know, the danger is when Definity finally launches, people are just like, meh, you know? We've seen all this before. So, it, you know, in, in the current environment, um, you know, for it would be fatal for Definity just to release all its code open source in advance of launch because, you know, hundreds of projects will pull the code and that would undermine Definitive's ability to raise funding, for example. So, yeah, there was, okay, I understand. Then the second question is, for example, in your, I think, white paper and some papers, you were kind of criticizing Algorand, um, and basically you said the Algorand is not as good as the Definity. I think the Algorand had all the details in their paper, research paper, while uh, your details are not available to other people, while like oh, I, I think the Avalanche also uses the VRF, and Algorand also uses the VRF, so, and there are some you know similarity between the I think threshold relay and the VRFs. So yeah, uh, so how I, do you compare those three? Yeah. Well, I, I'm not allowed to criticize any other project. The PR people say I'm not never. I you know I love to talk about it, but I'm not allowed to say anything. Um, but I, I will talk about Algorand a little bit because, I mean, people get confused. And so, uh, you know, I came up with Threshold Relay in early 2015 and um, I think Macaulay independently came up with his yeah. demo coin thing. Like, he probably was thinking about it at the same time and then he published this paper. Um, and we're both using a VRF, we're, we're both generating a VRF. So, first of all, with respect to Threshold Relay, um, you know, if you if the, the the public keys of the groups are fixed, um, the random numbers that are produced are completely unmanipulable, right? This is very very important. Uh, even if the adversary, an adversary just means like some kind of bad guy, right? Who controls all the, he can do whatever he likes. He can subvert the protocol, and if he controls the computer, he knows about all the data on the computer and so on. Even if an adversary controls all the members of a group somehow, which obviously is designed to be statistically overwhelmingly improbable, but even if he did, right, he couldn't, um, you know, manipulate the random beacon. He could stop it. He could stop it producing the next number, but he couldn't manipulate the sequence because we, you know, the BLS is a unique and deterministic uh, signature algorithm, and it remains that way in. Uh, threshold form, so it doesn't matter what subset of the group sign, you always get the same uh, random number signature, random number out, right? So, um, you know, by using threshold cryptography, first of all, um, we guarantee the random beacon is completely unmanipulable. This is an absolutely invaluable property. Like, why would anyone want a random beacon that doesn't have that property? Secondly, um, it's fault tolerant because, uh, you know, you, you only need the threshold of the group to participate to, cr to create the next random number. So if you design the, if you model it correctly, you can make it, um, you know, within the bounds of your assumptions, unstoppable. So it's unmanipulable, unstoppable, um, and actually in the case of uh, Divinity, very efficient. So you know, if you have a group of group sizes 400, um, you can produce the next random number with about 22 kilobytes of data. So and it turns out that it's broadcast, right? So you know, you can have a a huge network of 100 million nodes. If it's in some utopian future when Definity is taken over from Amazon Web Services and Google Cloud, right? Um, you have 100 million computers, and yeah, guess what? You, you know, 22 kilobytes of data are broadcast across the network, and you've created the next random number. Every single computer on the network knows that's the next random number. They don't have to run a consensus protocol. So we're creating the sequence of random numbers without running a consensus protocol. And um, of course, we then use those random numbers to drive other other protocols. For example, that you know produce agreement. But it's an enormous. It's very simple as well. It's a pretty simple thing. Um, so from this simple mechanism, we are able to create an unmanipulable, unpredictable. Of course, you can't predict because you need the next group to be selected and then the, the, the threshold of the correct participants to connect create the next random number. So unmanipulable, unstoppable, unpredictable sequence of random numbers is produced with extreme efficiency, like 22 kilobytes per random number. Um, I said back in 2015, the reality is everybody's going to end up using this protocol. There's just no way that anyone's going to find something um, of, of equivalent power. It's obvious, right? And everybody in the industry knows it, right? But nobody wants to admit it because they're all trying to 
raise money from ICOs. Um, but you can think about this, right? You can produce an unmanipulable, unstoppable, unpredictable sequence of random numbers with 22 kilobytes a number. It works in a network of any size, right? And you can use these random numbers. If, you know, the great thing about random numbers is you can use them to drive uh, distributed protocols that, that create agreement, even, even if there's a lot of asynchrony in the network and things like that. So inevitably, people are going to use that, right? So first of all, we use threshold relay to uh, produce the random numbers. Mikali, um, in the Algorand thing, and there's a bunch of funny stuff that he does, but um, I haven't read the paper for a while, but you know, uh, it's not unmanipulable, right? For example, um, I hope I'm not getting too technical, but he uses what I call a scratch card protocol, right? So um, on each new round, everybody likes creates a signature on the previous random number. And if your signature, which is a random number, of course, is below the, some target, that means you've got a winning scratch card and you can participate in consensus. And if you've got the lowest, you know, the lowest number, then you can be the leader, right? You're selected as leader. And um, the, the problem is, of course, that you know, um, if, if you see that you're the leader, you can do some calculations to see who might be the next leader if you don't act as leader. You can just go quiet, right? And you might say, well, hey, guess what? If I'm if I'm if I don't act as leader, then I know that the next leader will also be one of my nodes, and and maybe he can do a calculation, and so you, you can manipulate it. So the first thing is, um, I guess you would argue is that you have not very much power, but I mean I haven't got time to do a proper full analysis, but it's not unmanipulable, right? That's a really big problem. Um, it can also be prevented from proceeding by the leader um, just failing to do it do its job. Um, and there are some other kind of things. I mean, I don't like. Um, too technical. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, just I'm just quickly. That, that's what the other the biggest issue though with with that particular thing is he's using a BFT, right? Uh, consensus protocol and. Uh, uh, if you DOS the network and the timeout assumptions are hit, rather than the network slowing down, which is as a blockchain like Divinity does, um, it just produces nil blocks. So that's that's the biggest flaw, and it's not really suitable for a decentralized network at all because you can't have a decentralized network that experiences some asynchrony because of a DDoS attack and then just produces nil blocks. So that's why I don't, I don't think it's a very good protocol myself. I think it's very complex as well. Sorry. So, um, so I, I think uh, you have lots of novelty in how you, I mean, run it without requiring human supervision and things like that, and nice algorithms uh, for <clears throat> selecting the nodes. Now, one of the questions I had was that, I mean, why do you want to build the entire system? I mean, there are already, I mean, good operating system for each individual node. Do you want to also, I mean, completely uh, overhaul the the system stack and uh, create entire new layer of on top of uh, what's already there in yeah. the network? So it's it's not so. We're trying to get rid of the old system stack, and it's it's not a cloud. Um, you know, it's, it's if you want to if you want to run a Microsoft SQL Server, Internet Information Services, ASP.NET. Um, some kind of app, all that stuff, right? You should put it on EC2 and get yourself a yeah. firewall and this kind of stuff. So, Definity um, has a completely different vision for how software should be credited. In Definity, um, on on the server side, there are no files. There's no database. It's a completely different model um, um, for developing software uh, using a thing called orthogonal persistence. So, software uh, has eternal execution; it just runs forever. So it's a very different model. It's a bit, it's a bit like process memory persists forever. And uh, it, it, it probably would take some explaining, but the overall objective is to create a kind of bargain where you know the traditional st software stack, which you can't make secure, you can't make reliable. It's very complex. You know, if it, most software engineers, when they build a system, a business system, 
you know, 90% of their time is just spent configuring things and making, making the database talk to the web server and managing the connection pool. Only a fraction of their time is spent writing business logic. So that's that's what AWS and Google, Google Cloud tried to remove, right? They do, yeah. So there's things like Lambda, which are more in the direction of Definity. Um, however, I think, you know, people will see that, um, uh, first of all, uh, the Definity model is different to Lambda. We think it'll prove superior. Um, and that's a whole long conversation, yeah. obviously. So, you know, there's the Definity model. But, um, you know, it's also that it runs on an open system. So I think in the end, um, people are going to want to build on open systems. So, for example, if you want to create open internet services, well, that's not going to work if everyone's building on Google. I mean, right? Um, you, you can't even create autonomous software on Google and Amazon, right? Microsoft is there. So, um, you know, Definity will support lots of things that, you know, these traditional cloud hosting op op centralized cloud hosting operations can't. Um, and, you know, the idea that even if somehow you know, Google credits some or Amazon credits some economic model so you could create autonomous software, it's like autonomous software at the whim of Amazon, right? I, I think the no, I, I understand that, I mean, there, is, there are those, I mean, giants that have maybe too much power. But, I mean, from practical point of view, right? I mean, you said, okay, you're going to do away with files, do away with uh, relational database. But, I mean, people have been trained to, say, uh, ask queries, I mean, using SQL or, I mean, oh. even, yeah, Python or R. Absolutely, sure. But I, I think in the end, you know, this is how it works. Um, if you look at... What is the biggest platform, back-end platform in use today? Node.js. Now, I hate JavaScript. Um, Node.js is an abomination, right? It's horrible. And I feel sorry for anyone that has to use Node. But there's a reason people use Node. The new, the younger engineers came in and they learned JavaScript first of all because they were creating applications in the web browser. And then Node came along and it just recycled all those JavaScript developers because they didn't want to le learn all the other stuff. So they just said, oh yeah, well, let's use Node, right? And Node gives me a way of... So uh, Definity, um, to some extent, will recycle WebAssembly developers. People who um, learn WebAssembly for the browser will suddenly find that they can write code that executes on the internet computer um, and that runs forever has this orthogonal persistence. So they don't really need any special skills. Like these guys will be empowered to create complete systems using end-to-end -end web assembly with much greater productivity. And not only will, compared to the old dudes who are stuck configuring their databases and web servers and firewalls and microservices and all that junk that we want to get rid of, this new generation of engineers won't have to deal with any of that. They're going to find they can develop systems with much lower cost, first of all, and their systems will be, you know, much more secure, much more reliable, able to preserve the privacy of data in the way that, you know, as we've seen, the traditional technology stack can't really, much more highly interoperable with each other. So, you know, I think in the end, uh, developers will use it, you know, the younger generation developers will begin to use it, and then other developers will see that these guys have got superpowers, right? Compared to them, they got superpowers because firstly, they're able to produce systems much faster. Okay. These systems are more secure, more reliable. So that, that's how it's like, it, it's a complete, complete um, step change. It's not trying to re-engineer the existing system, it's trying to replace it. Got it. Maybe last question for that. Yeah. Sure. So do you need, will you need any special hardware or is going to be, uh, is there any definitive node will look like the current servers? So, um, <clears throat> So the Definity protocol, um, every node in the network is connected to the main chain, right? So the main chain, if you like, is the provides a single logical clock and a single point of agreement. So you know, network-wide consensus is recorded in the main chain, but um, other nodes are um, you know assigned to partitions called shards, and actually in the Definity network, shards will have different widths. Right, um, and people can choose depending on their security requirements and other things how big they, how wide they want their shard to be. But anyway, the important point is all of the 
uh, nodes within a shard have to have the, the same hardware specification because they're in fact symmetric replicas. So they're all performing exactly the same computations and storing the same data. So if the nodes in a shard didn't have the same hardware specification, um, the danger is one of them might fall behind, for example, when the shard was under heavy load. Then how would you upgrade the hardware? I mean, not upgrade hundreds of hundred millions of... Well, you wouldn't. So, um, you know, a shard once created, you know, would presumably eventually form, fall into obsolescence. But, um, you know, it, shards that have previously been created will continue to exist. And, uh, you know, over time, you know, the Definity Network will produce new specifications. Um, but those nodes coming into the network will obviously, you know, declare themselves as meeting one of those specifications. And we can support that way. We can, we can create an open market for hardware. That's one of our objectives. So, you know, we ultimately want, um, when, you know, when, when um, developers, up, you know, upload their systems to the internet computer, they can specify, you know, the width of the shard, but also the kind of hardware the shard is running. And now, different kinds of hardware are, are going to have really important implications. So, for example, um, I, I believe Enclave hardware is going to be uh, play a very important role in keeping data private in the future. But you know, Enclaves are an emerging area. So we've got SGX1 at the moment, uh, with the, from Intel has a number of vulnerabilities, and you can do all these side channel attacks. SGX2 will be better. You've got um, you know AMD's Secure Virtual Machine, whatever it's called, and, and there's open source projects as well to create Enclaves like Keystone. And uh, Risk Five is like an open source chip. So you know, we want to create an open environment where um, different kinds of hardware compete against each other. And there are, you know, yet more ideas. Some people are wanting to run, uh, create special hardware which uh, runs MPC, multi-party computation encryption, um, using FPGAs and all kinds of interesting stuff. So, you know, Definity will um, put different hardware specs out there and um, ultimately demand will determine kind of hardware that's incorporated into the network. But we're trying to create an open market for hardware. So you know, ultimately, you know, within the internet computer, Intel will have to compete against the open source hardware, right? But you know, if Intel are able to maintain a sufficient competitive advantage to all of the um, resources, then so, so be it. But it also means that you know, if, if, if one um, hardware manufacturer, for example, puts a back door into the hardware, right? imagine the effect. So it turns out that some big company, some big uh, chip manufacturers put a back door into their um, system, and he has a lot of controversy right now about the uh, you know, the management engine that's part of Intel architectures, right? And what does it do? Nobody knows what runs on this thing. Is it is the NSA hiding in there kind of thing? Um, if it turned out that one hardware manufacturer really was uh, deliberately creating back doors, um, well, this would greatly undermine them, and very probably they would find that people weren't uploading their software onto their shards using their hardware, right? And, you know, uh, you know, this is going to be a huge market. I mean, if the existing um, cloud is, you know, five to 10 million servers, because the because of all the extra encryption, which means there's more load on the CPU, and also because there's increased replication of data, it'll be like 50, 50 to 100 million servers, right? So the internet computer, if it succeeds, will be an, enor an enormously important market, if, if not the most important market for chip manufacturers. And so we must create an open environment where they can compete against each other. Um, and also, you know, use that competition to drive forward, you know, the, the security of enclaves and remove back doors and all the other kind of things people care about. Okay. Question, please. Uh, so I have a few questions. My first is, what are the requirements for me to start up a node and uh, join the network? So, um, yeah, we haven't launched the network yet, but before we do, um, we'll release some sp some specs. So, um, first of all, the node would have to meet the standard specs because um, the network kind of creates something like a cryptographic SLA, right? What is an SLA? Service level agreement. Uh, so, for example, if it specifies that your hard, you should have, um, uh, you know, for example, ten terabytes of storage, right? When you first connect it, okay, let's say a shard doesn't have any storage. But what's going to happen is the system's going to fill your 10 terabyte hard drive up with junk, but predictable junk. And then it has other 
uh, it has cryptographic techniques that enable it to detect, challenge you, and determine that you really have stored that data uniquely, not using your computer as a proxy, uniquely on your node, right? So, so you, you absolutely need to have the correct hardware, or you know you could fall foul of the cryptographic SLAs, and this could result in um, you know you, you receive instead of earning instead of earning rewards, you'd be getting fines, <laughs> right? Um, secondly, you'd need a sufficiently fast internet connection. So actually, here's a good example. This when I when I took this video, the network was behaving a bit funny. Like normally, it's it's pretty flat, but basically the way the the the, the probabilistic slot consensus works, um, if every um, block height orders all of the nodes, right, and everyone has a priority ordering, and so if you're slot zero and the highest priority node, you can broadcast your block immediately, and um, but if you don't do that within a certain time period, um, the network will relay. A block from the next highest priority node, and if you don't, and, and so on and so forth, and this means that um, you know if you don't produce your block fast enough, very probably another node just beneath you in the hierarchy in in, in the priority will 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 do so. So you won't re you won't be able to receive any re rewards either. So you need you need the right hardware with the right specification, and you need a fast internet connection or at least as fast as the other nodes. Uh, is there any like stake requirement? Oh yeah, that's the other thing. You, you need to create a, a thing called a mining identity. And you do that by making a, a deposit. And the size of the deposit will be determined by the blockchain nerve system. Uh, but the, the network will also determine when it wants more nodes to connect. So it doesn't create an unlimited competition like Bitcoin or Ethereum where you have a fixed issuance of rewards um, and you end up paying billions of dollars uh, a year in hosting fees for a network that only can pr process three transactions a second. So, you know, the Tefinity network will decide when it wants new nodes. And so basically what you do is you put it, you kind of make an application in the pool. And when, when the blockchain nervous system decides it wants to increase the size of the network, it uses the random beacon to select from some of the applications and then you get notified and you've got some amount of time to bring your node online. Couldn't you sort of Sybil attack that system and launch, um, or maybe borrow like a thousand dollars and make maybe like a hundred virtual nodes enter the applicant pool, uh, try to get chosen, and then just return the deposit for all the ones that didn't get chosen afterwards? Well, you don't get your deposit back. Just you can't just say, "Well, I've ha DDoSed you, and now you're gonna go want my deposit back." The system will um, not give you your money back. So. Um, you know, I mean, there's two things. First of all, um, you know, the, the, the deposit will be sufficiently expensive that, 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 that um, it, it'll be an expensive exercise. And of course, when the, when the protocol realizes that you haven't brought your nodes online, um, it'll just, you know, bring on some other nodes and all that will happen to you is you've lost your deposit, effectively. Uh, so I have two more questions. So next one is, so is the chart, is the shard that my node gets put into, is it based, is it based on similar hardware then or is it random? No, it's similar hardware, yeah. So that, there won't, for obvious reasons, there won't be that many kind, different kinds of hardware, right? Because otherwise you, you know, re reduce some of the security problems of the network. Wouldn't that cause issues, though, if I launch maybe like 100 of the exact same spec, they're all in the same shard and I control? So, the, the, I mean, I've mean, I got to be careful how much information I reveal, but the network w will launch at a sufficient scale that that won't happen. So there's a kind of minimum scale. I would certainly... You know, if you think the test network has 400 nodes, I'd love to see the network launch with, you know, tens of thousands of nodes. Hmm. I just asked. Uh, yeah, uh, I think we need to wrap up a little bit. Um, so maybe one last question, I think, then one short question. Very short question. Uh, for the, the, the protocol being so, you know, using the uh, random numbers, uh, is there any concern about using mostly the pseudo random numbers, software based? That, or do you see that maybe we need to worry about true random numbers, maybe hardware dependent? So, so that's an interesting question. Definity um, has it, it, the Definity network represents the first time in human history that we've ever had a source of unpro truly unmanipulable, truly unmanipulable uh, and unpredictable random numbers. Um, there's never been a time in human history that we, we've been able to, to do something like this. 
I mean, maybe you could do something with something like a quantum device that whatever, right? Maybe. But um, you know, in practical terms, uh, if you want to create random numbers in a large network and everybody can like, if you, the, the trouble with using a hardware device to to to, to, gen to generate the random numbers is. I mean, how do we know whether these numbers have been correctly generated? Like you can say you've got some quantum device that's generating a sequence of random numbers, but how do I know that it's a quantum device that's producing a sequence of random numbers? And the point uh, with threshold relay is that everybody in the network knows that these random numbers um, are genuinely random and nobody can, could have predicted what they were, right? And, uh, you know, very simply, you, you, you can imagine why this is the case, right? It, if you give me a message, and I'm going to create a cryptographic signature on it, right? You give me a message, I've got a public key and a private key. You give me a message, I'm going to create a cryptographic signature on that message, right? Well, that signature must be a random number. If the signature wasn't a random number, then you could predict it, right? So the signature has to be a random number, otherwise you can predict it. So if, if the signature isn't a random number, then the whole of cryptography is broken, right? So the signature has to be a random number. The, the key thing with BLS is it's a unique deterministic signature algorithm. So if you look at ECDSA, which is what Bitcoin uses, you remember this thing called transaction malleability? Yeah, the problem is that the signer can mix random numbers into the uh, scheme so that they can create different, different random numbers, right? Um, whereas BLS, you can only produce a single, it's unique and deterministic, it's only a single signature that's po possible. Given, given the message, the public key, there's only a single signature that's possible. But it's a random number, otherwise it wouldn't be secure. So we use um, threshold cryptography so that gr you know, a, group, a group has a public key and you need some proportion of that group to create the signature on the message. But the interesting thing is, wh whichever subset of that group whichever subset of that group collaborates to create the signature, the signature is always the same. There's only one possible signature. The unique and deterministic property survives into the threshold variant of the signature scheme. And so the beautiful thing is that, you know, so you, you have the signature of one group, right? This selects another group randomly. That next group creates a signature on the previous signature. Um, but you know, and to generate a new random number, but only when, you know, this, in the case of our system, the majority of the group participants, a majority of the group participants create the next signature, i.e. correct processes, correct, you know, well-functioning participants, decide it's time to create the next number, can it, can it appear? And until that point is unpredictable. Um, but yet, the um, signature, given the key of the group and the input signature is entirely deterministic. There's no possibility it can be manipulated. And anybody inside the network can look at the public key of the group and see that given the previous random number, the signature is, the random number is correct. So, you know, it, it provides a way for everybody in the network to agree on, on, on the random number without any, there being any chance of manipulation. Um, so that's the problem with a hardware device. Yeah, hardware, you might create a hardware device that produces random numbers, but who has the hardware device? How can you convince everybody else that he's created the, um, the random numbers correctly? He hasn't manipulated them. And, and, and moreover, what happens if, some, you know, if, if the hardware device fails? It, we need something that's unstoppable. So that means we have to um, have, you know, in the case of Definity, we have each group is, has 400 nodes. And you only need 201 of the nodes to collaborate to produce a random number. So to give you an idea of the math, you know, if you had a network of 10,000 nodes, you have a network of 10,000 nodes, 7,000 nodes are correct, 3,000 nodes are faulty. I, you know, say 3,000 nodes are controlled by a malicious adversary. And if you take a random group of 400, right, you randomly select 400 nodes, the probability that 200 or more are faulty using hypergeometric probability is, is, is 10 to the minus 17. So I mean, it's you know, heat death of the universe time, right? So you get something that um, is unstoppable. It's completely unmanipulable by the math. And um, yeah, it's unpredictable because you know, once you selected the next group, you, need the, you, know, you can't find the random number until the group has decided it's time to pr produce it. So uh, it's really a very, very powerful thing. It's actually the first time in human history that we've had, had a mechanism for producing 
random numbers in this form that's completely unmanipulable, unstoppable, and unpredictable. And that, that enables everybody to agree on that, right? Because all they need to know, they can look at the signature, the, the, the public key of the group, and just check the signature against the public key of the group and know that it's correct. So it's really a very, it's a very simple system. Sure, you know, it hasn't, yeah. Yeah. It's the first time, so I mean, you know, yeah. So, so you know, people, people have needed random numbers before. So there's, for example, NIST, the um, National Institute for Technology or whatever it is. It's like, or standards for, National, National Institute for Standards for Technology or something like American. So they produce a random beacon, right? Um, but, you know, there is, it's problematic. How do you know that the, the random number you receive is actually the random number that NIST generated? How do you know there's not somebody working at NIST? Um, in fact, there probably is, who knows the entire sequence of random numbers in advance. It's kind of useless for the kind of, for, for driving a network like Definity. So, um, yeah, I think the, uh, the, the, the um, random number generation is, um, yeah, big, uh, even though it's uh, relatively simple, the mechanism is relatively simple, but it, it, it's, a, it's a big leap forward in its own way. And it, it turns out you can do other things with random numbers. So, you know, we have this protocol called Phi, which is a decentralized commercial banking system. And we put um, sort of loan validators in a game using random numbers to enable them to, to enable the computer to issue loans. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of, and also other protocols, I mean, there's something on 2050, called uh, validation towers and validation trees um, that were driven by the random beacon that can scale out validation. And, yeah, so random numbers are a really powerful thing. And even before blockchain, I mean, of course, even Nakamoto consensus, right, is really, it's a kind of caveman random number generator, right? Like proof of work is just a random number generator. That's how it works, right? You have a, uh, everyone, you know, creates a block of transactions, creates the hash. Is the hash beneath the target? The hash is just a number. Is the number beneath some other number, the target number? No, spin the nonce, create another and keep on spinning the nonce until you've got a the hash of your block is beneath the target. And if you're the first person to, um, uh, you know, get credit block with a hash beneath the target, you can broadcast it. You're like elected, randomly elected as leader. So, you know, proof of work is just a very basic, brutal, r random number generator. Um, it's like a caveman system, right? Uh, much better to use threshold relay to generate the random numbers. Um, not waste all the electricity, do it faster. And also, of course, proof of work isn't very secure, it's manipulable, whereas this system is completely unmanipulable under any circumstances by anybody. Even if the, an adversary controls the entire network, he can't, he can't manipulate the random numbers that the cryptography produces, unless some fundamental principle of mathematics turns out to be wrong or misunderstood. Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thanks. I think that was the most